so first some introductions. Um, who's Lavery Pennell and, and why am I here? Um, we're a strategic advisory firm uh, looking at creating value for companies, mostly and especially around profitable sustainability. So sorry, John, I'm using that word there, but let's say caring and looking after, but, but I've qualified it, uh, around resource efficiency, supply chain collaboration, uh, new technologies and business models. That's where we find the greatest opportunities uh, in a number of sectors. There's some of our clients there. Um, we've done a number of projects with Interface, Shell. Mazda City was particularly exciting. Um, and there's our um, perhaps not so photogenic team. Uh, and then the next question is, what's the next manufacturing revolution? Well, um, we found ourselves about a year and a half ago speaking with Steve and speaking with Two Degrees, and Steve was speaking to Two Degrees, and we all said, well, we all believe the same thing. We think there's a great opportunity out there that's being missed by the manufacturing community around non-labour resource effect e efficiency and effectiveness. At the time, we didn't know that's what it was, but we knew there was something there. So we sat down um, and put our heads together and decided, well, let's just get together in a not-for-profit collaborative way, um, not in any formal way, but nevertheless, we've all collaborated together on a report, which you'll see in a minute, and a work plan. Um, our aim was to quantify the value, not just in dollar terms, but also in environmental and social terms, um, of good practice along seven different areas of resource efficiency. Let's call them seven dimensions. Um, on a sub-sector level, we didn't want, we're, we're sick of seeing these benchmarking reports that say the best company in the world is here, average companies are here, therefore the gap looks like this. It doesn't apply that generally. Of course, there's um, significant differences between subsectors. The other reason we went to a subsector level is many of our clients say, oh, well, you've got some numbers, but they're not relevant to me. So that was one of the big questions we wanted to answer was what is relevant for a company and can you really have a conversation um, to show that there are opportunities there with an organisation? We also wanted to go beyond that to identify business opportunities uh, and develop solutions to barriers um, and, and a roadmap for change, which is an ongoing piece of work which I'll talk you through in a moment. So setting the context, I think in the last couple of days we've talked a lot about the challenges that businesses are facing uh, that are sustainability related, whether you like it or not. So resource constraints, externalities being internalised, uh, uncertainty and volatility creeping in, corporate responsibility, new technologies, all of these are challenges in the business environment right now. And they're leading to real concerns around rising prices, business risk, etc., etc. <coughs> We're all familiar with these. Um, the flip side of every uh, challenge of, is, of course, an opportunity. So, uh, th and this is the way that, that Lavery Pennell chooses to sort of look at the world of opportunities <coughs> around profitable sustainability. Let's call it an opportunities map. And there are I'll take some time to talk you through this. So what we find consistently is that within the boundary of a factory, there are operations optimization opportunities around energy, around process waste, packaging, water, and internal transport. Um, and many of those, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, have not been particularly well pursued by every company, uh, some of them quite poorly by many companies. But that's an inside the factory gate view. If we then step back upstream, to suppliers, there are opportunities to work with suppliers to say, okay, what, are, what is their energy use, transport, packaging, waste, and how can we work together? Now, as engineers, we all recognise that optimising across two systems is always going to be more efficient than optimising ag against single systems. Um, and there are some really classic examples, like the uh, classic Walker's potato crisps example, where which, which Nick Pennell, give us a wave, Nick, Nick worked on that when he was at Booz with me, um, working for the Carbon Trust, because what walkers were doing was taking the potatoes inside their site boundary, frying off the water, which was taking a lot of energy, and then the potato manufacturing process continues. But what they didn't know is on the other side of the fence, the potato growers were taking the potatoes out of the ground into a humidification shed to put as much water into those <laughs> potatoes as they could. And of course, there's a massive issue. And Nick and his team just went, hang on a minute, why don't we change the contract? And immediately you lost 16% of your frying energy um, and a good proportion of energy and wasted effort and money and capital and inventory at the farmer's end. So there's a win-win solution, right? A classic example. Now you can all say, oh, that's a one-off, that won't happen in my industry. But actually it happens all the time. You just don't see it. Because, as I said, optimising across two uh, is often more efficient than optimising the one. 
on customers and consumers. Again, you can take, take that same principle and say, what can we do to help our customers? Now, there are many car companies who are saying, well, let's optimise our cars so they use less fuel in their in-use phase. We're all familiar with that. So let's recognise that a lot of great companies do a lot of great work. Unilever with their washing cold water well, laundry detergents uh, and, in fact, waterless shampoo, those sorts of ideas uh, fit very well in that space there. There is, of course, this fourth loop over the top around recycling or closed loop, very fashionable these days, uh, especially around remanufacturing, recycling uh, and packaging reuse. Don't need to say any more around that. And then there's this fifth area of opportunity that we find uh, with working with peers and competitors on cross-industry collaboration because sometimes that helps a company or an industry to find the scale it needs to pull through waste infrastructure, transport infrastructure, recycling infrastructure, or even, for instance, in the case of airlines, actually fuel infrastructure that says, we can't do biofuels airport by airport, airline by airline. Actually, what you need is all the airlines to, to group together. And then, all of a sudden, you hit the scale necessary for a biofuel plant. Combine that with a nice feedstock source at a reasonable price and you've got quite an economic proposition. What's missing though is that peer-to-peer -peer comp competition. And Nick and I um, and the rest of our team actually believe that this is probably 10 to 20 years off because the minute you're a smart engineer, you go to your boss and say, I've got this great thing. All it needs is for us, Unilever, to, to work together with Procter & Gamble and a couple of other com companies. What does the boss do? Alarm goes off. Go and talk to our legal people. The legal person says, no, forget it. That's anti-competitive. Can't do it, right? And that's nonsense because at the, at the end of the day, there are ways around that. Viz, for instance, is trying to open up a white space to have those sorts of com conversations. There's a group called CO3, which is bringing organisations who compete uh, together around carbon, uh, low carbon transport uh, and combining loads. And there are various other ways. And, and I, I work with a, a company in Australia that was actually looking after cash transport um, for, on behalf of all of the, the major banks, which basically said, why is it that when you've got four ATMs that are all different banks in, in a shopping centre, you know what happens. The first one runs out, everyone moves to the next one, right? So if you can firstly top all of those up at the same time, that's an efficiency. And then if you've got a smart system that tells you one's running out, you can actually then react to that in a lot more efficient way, for example. So anyway, that's a sort of map of, let's call them opportunities. The next thing that I wanted to discuss was, was sort of well, what, what, where is all this opportunity and why does it exist and is it real? I mean, there's a big question there. So let, let me paint you a picture that we developed based on um, figures from, uh, a, I think a couple from DEC, but most of these for, were Office for National Statistics, which you yourselves can download. This is not top secret information. This is readily available. Uh, we analysed that as the next manufacturing revolution, i.e. Institute for Manufacturing, Lavery, Pinnell and Two Degrees. And what we found is some really interesting things. So I'll talk you through this. So if we consider that left-hand axis, which is uh, billions of pounds of cost, and then we've obviously got time across the bottom. Let's consider first the blue line. Now, for a this is for the manufacturing sector. That blue line is labour costs in the manufacturing sector, which started at around 100, 100 billion a year in 1995 and has dropped to about 750 uh, billion this, yes, 750 billion this, this well, 2011, the latest year. And what we saw is sort of, yes, it was flattish, flattish, slow improvement at around minus 1%. And then come 2004, some really accelerated improvements, right? Now, if you're a manufacturing organisation in the contemporary paradigm, that's good news, right? That means we're doing our jobs, we're reducing our costs. What you don't see, though, is that these columns here, which are read on this line, is the millions of full-time employees in manufacturing, which back in... Um, 1999 was about four and a half million people. The result of this continual labour productivity uh, in 2011 means we're down to about two and a half million full-time employees. The manufacturing sector has lost a million and a half jobs in that period, down to two and a half million people. So you say, well, actually, if we operate on a very simple triple bottom line basis, there's a big social cost from doing that, right? And that means someone's got to pick up the bill of so of the medical care for those people, the housing, et cetera, et cetera. Conversely, so, so that's all bad news, but, the, but nevertheless, the, man, the manufacturing paradigm says this is good. But conversely, if we look at the red line, which is all of the other non-labour input costs, so that's goods, materials and services going into manufacturing. First note, it's big. It's about, in those days, it was about 375 million. Now it's about just under 350 billion a year, which is, by the way, there about 
three point something times, three and a half times. Here it's four and a half times what the labour bill is. And yet, what's really surprising, despite some very good work here to slowly bring that down, that for the last, well, 2004 to 2011 has actually been increasing. That, from a manufacturing perspective, is a disaster. Now we know why, so prices have been going up. But every manufacturer worth their salt should every, be, every year be crunching these costs down, all of them, labour and non-labour, by 1% to 2% per annum. There's a whole lot of background factors that make that easier because you're getting better equipment, because you're getting better prices, you're getting more efficient, but that should be marching down. So we identified that there's a real issue there. So this idea of non-labour productivity, which um, Steve quite correctly refers to it as sort of productivity in the 21st century, um, which you can also refer to as the elephant in the room because we still see regular announcements from manufacturers that, oh, economy's not going so well, how are we going to cut costs? We're going to cut heads. And we would suggest that there are, that's an, an approach and we're not going to criticise people for that even though it has a social respo response from that. But actually there are much better things you do because when you start to address this, you're not attacking jobs, in fact you're creating jobs as I'll show you in a minute, but also you've got an environmental benefit because you're using less raw, raw, raw materials along the lines of the previous uh, slides that I talked through. So that's the context. So we then set about a year and a bit uh, of work looking at seven different areas along the supply chain to say, well, okay, what are these really worth along the dimensions of dollars, uh, environmental and social benefits? And this is what we found. So we call this a tri-benefit diagram because it's got three sets of benefits that we've defined. And interesting, the benefits are absolutely massive. Now, <coughs> this is the combination of those seven areas. And historically, each of those seven areas have been discussed on a single basis. So there's a discussion, oh yes, energy efficiency, well it's not very big is it? Well when you start to add these things up you get a much more interesting conversation under an umbrella topic of non-labour resource productivity or next manufacturing revolution, whichever you choose to use, you get a much bigger number that is a lot more CEO worthy of a conversation. So to talk you through this, 10 billion per annum in terms of profit improvement, which is worth, on average, to UK manufacturers, a 12% profit increase per annum. Three, 300,000 new jobs, which is a 12% increase in UK manufacturing jobs on that base of 1.5 that we just saw, sorry, 2.5 that we just saw. 27 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, which we used as our proxy for environmental benefits. That's dropping the entire UK annual footprint by 4.5%. And that's not the end of the story because there's all these other additional benefits around reduced price volatility, improved supply security, reduced exposure to non-labour input cost rises in the future, greater sustainability, and I don't know if it's there or not, but indirect jobs. So these 300,000 were just straight manufacturing related jobs. And we all know that there's a factor of, depending on who you talk to or what you read, one and a half to maybe three times that in jobs from local shopkeepers, from car cleaners, from all sorts of people that spin off from those core manufacturing jobs. So there's, this is a pretty big number, which is why we had uh, a, couple of, um, a couple of months ago a very successful launch um, in the Houses of Parliament with Minister Greg, Gregory Barker going, this is bang on, this is exactly what we need to do. We've got the video in case you need to do it. Um, he's on tape saying that. Um, so I, I started to mention these additional benefits in here. Um, uh, there's some real social things in here like less traffic congestion. The minute you reduce, improve your transport efficiency, there's fewer trucks on the road, which means there's more road space for all of us and avoided road upgrading costs and maintenance costs and the list goes on and on. So there's a whole bunch of knock-on benefits that I shan't bore you with. The other overarching um, conclusion we came to as we did our work, this is, this is sort of our typical sort of template that we use to describe the information that we found. I'll talk you through it in a minute, but you will notice immediately this comes up, there's a lot of household names and they're not all performing at the same level. So let me explain how to read this, it's a little bit novel. Um, this is the average annual savings on a compound basis from a starting point along a time basis like this. What we decided was you couldn't say this company at this point, therefore they've improved by so much. What you could do though is understand when companies baselined and started their journey. So for when a company started their journey, that's zero for them. Some of them have been on quite a long journey like some of these guys. 
this is their annual improvement. But when you put the two together to say, well, we've been going at 6% per annum for, let's say, about 13 years, like Procter & Gamble have been, you get to an overall saving there of around 50%. So you can put isoclines on these of 75% improvement. Well done, Steve. Toyota's doing very well on this. Um, and you can put 25% and you can put 10%. And then you can plot companies on basically on publicly available information and the ones that aren't shown aren't from publicly <coughs> available information. But you get some really surprising things. So who likes to talk a lot about their environmental uh, accolades? Coca-Cola, and yet they're not doing that well. But until you actually put everything on the one database, it's very difficult to find that out, right? Because we, this, is an, this by the way, is energy intensity. So it's energy in either gigajoules or kilowatt hours per ton of product. So this is all normalised. There's a lot of working goes on behind the scenes to take some fairly basic numbers and, and come up with this. But the variation is absolutely enormous between some of these com companies. Uh, and if we've got time at the end, I'll take you through the equivalent for packaging, uh, road transport uh, and waste as well. We've got all those sorts of st statistics. But please note that this is an enormous range, even within subsectors uh, of the manufacturing economy. Another way of looking at that, and let's take, for example, here, packaging weight. Each one of these lines is a stock-keeping unit or a SKU. So that might be in the, let's say, beer category. That might be a 330 milliliter can, might be one stock-keeping unit. Another might be a 500 milliliter bottle, for example. Those are stock-keeping units. And look at the enormous variation here amongst, amongst these. Cereal, what's going on between there and there in terms of variation in the packaging? Um, within the SKUs. And this is freely available information from the RAP database, so you can actually have a look online at this and find it yourself. Again, a story of, wow, there's enormous variations, even within the, manuf the manufacturing sector around food and beverage, even within SKUs, enormous variation. Um, and, and, and so, sorry, let me come back to it. So, so on this one, what I wanted to really point out is that where there are companies saying we're doing our best, it's very deceptive because often these companies are very busy executives that don't really know what the latest is because many of them went through university quite a while ago. They're super busy. They've been downsized by my former colleagues in, in the management consulting profession. They've got a lot on their plate and it's very, very difficult for them to stay up to date with what's the latest, especially build the business case and all their job, let's face it, pretty much their job is about hitting the short-term targets and getting productivity out the door and worrying about sacking people because that's the directive that's coming down in tight economic times. So what we like to do and what this database is all about helping you to do is when someone says, I think we're doing the best, and let's remember also there's a trick question there. If you ask someone who's the head of engineering, if the CEO asks the head of engineering, are you doing your best with energy efficiency? That's like saying, are you doing your job properly, right? I mean, that's, there's a classic response to that, of course I am. Let me give you an example. We've just changed out five light bulbs or we've just got a new piece of equipment, right? So we need to break through that level of conversation to, and, and the way that we need to do that, as Steve said, ruthless data, and this is part of the ruthless data that we are now all armed with, because this is all publicly available, to say, yes, we understand where you're coming from, let's see where you really are. If you'd like to give us your data, we can plot this on this and find out for you what the opportunities might be. Um, bringing it all together, I mean, I, I thought you might be interested in sort of the energy efficiency results as an example. Here's the story. There's a really interesting energy efficiency story in the UK. So since 1990, there's been a steady increase of, well, half to 1% per year going on, which we call background improvement, right? And that's things like, well, every bit of equipment that you, you buy is going to be a little bit more efficient than the last one because, let's face it, those manufacturers have been working on the background at doing that. So that, that's what we call the background improvement. What we saw is around here, energy prices started to escalate quite seriously. And we saw some companies starting to get very serious. And on average, your companies actually added over that period another sort of 10% savings between 2002 and 2010. But that's not the whole story because the best practice companies, which are here on average across the subsectors, so this is a sort of roll-up graph, if you like, on average, the best practice guys actually started a couple of years early and have actually added another 20% on their saving. So they've... So that's the, if you like, the potential between average and best practice. There's a 20% saving in energy efficiency. And in the manufacturing sector, which uses roughly 10 billion of energy every year, 10 billion pounds, that's a very significant saving, right? It's two, it's two billion right there. 
So that sort of story you can form up when you actually, that you can create a narrative when you've actually dug into what those statistics were. And we're very pleased to be able to do that uh, with Steve and Two Degrees help. The other thing we found um, around this variability question is that good practice companies are actually attacking non-labour resource productivity on four different levels. They're doing the incremental stuff, right? The quick wins. And they're finding savings of between 5 and 10 percent. They're also attacking processes and systems, finding typical savings of 10 to 20 percent. And those are things like, well, let's get a team to look at that. Let's think about how we start up. Let's think about what we do at lunchtime. Actually, that's more, lunchtime turnoffs is more the incremental. But let's think about how we do things in our organisation. Not a big capex, um, sometimes a little bit of opex, but again, quite quick paybacks, although it can be very difficult to bring that sort of change into your organisation. Um, a third level is structural change, and every engineer likes a shiny new piece of equipment. Let's face that, right? And most companies are very good at that. So we go to many companies and they say, oh yes, we'd love to be more efficient, but we can't get enough capex because of tight conditions. And we say, well, okay, that's great. Um, can we help you free up that capex? So that's question number one. But question number two is, what about these sorts of opportunities? Oh, well, that can be quite difficult because it involves people, but actually a whole lot of other process change. So. Uh, we tend to find a lot of opportunities in here. So saying, I mean, this, whilst structural stuff has a quite a large capex requirement, it's still got a 20 to 40 percent saving, so that's quite large. And then finally, the big area is uh, core redesign with a 20 to 50 percent potential, where we say, why is it you do what you do? What, what is your product, and does it have to be in the form that it's in? Do you need to distribute globally? Do you need to think about your product such that you can change it into a service? Uh, such that you can redesign the model from a single use to a collaborative uh, use model, for example. Massive savings potential there, but can be very slow and difficult because it does challenge the status quo right now. And I think we've had some good conversations about that today. So I just wanted to share those learnings with you. The barriers. So here's, remember we said we wanted to look at the barriers. Um, senior executive leadership's been discussed a couple, a couple of times today, a really big problem. Information, resources, Skill mix. Now, interestingly, we're not saying need to have a massive training program in this. It's just about having the right people in the room because those right people need to embody engineering, commercial skills to be able to build a, a, a coherent business case that the CFO is going to love, change management, systems thinking, all those sorts of things. And I would have thought most of us in the room are well equipped to do this sort of work. Design um, and the, the RSA's uh, work in uh, design is sort of a part of this. Uh, and then there's some legal stuff, which by the way, you'll note most of these are not policy changes. The government actually doesn't need to do much of these. You have a look at some of the savings, they pretty much stand alone. If you get your senior executives moving, that can actually be the biggest influencer. However, there are some legal hiccups, like ha what you call um, second-hand product. That can actually influence the way that buyers think about that and actually harm your chances of remanufacturing and getting a decent price for that, right? So there are a couple of legal things and some also sticky ones around infrastructure and collaboration. So what do you do on that? So what we actually said is, well, actually, there are some barriers here that we can start to address. So the next manufacturing revolution community has been formed. It's cited mostly on two degrees, although we have our own next manufacturing revolution website, which you're welcome to subscribe to. Two Degrees have a platform which has got 32,000 sustainability professionals uh, and they're undertaking a series of webinars, events, site visits, all this sort of stuff to really build the next manufacturing re revolution community. The second thing we want to do is tailored support and we've already started this, working with organisations who, who are saying, well look, this, we're not like everyone else, how can we actually, how can I as a, as a chief sustainability officer or a sustainability professional or a head of strategy, how can I get this message into my organisation and unlock some of the funds that I need in order to chase down some of these? Now, I'm not talking big funds, I'm talking more let's get the business case built and get that up to the chief executive's office so that they can actually see how much saving there is. That's a very s specific thing. So what we're offering is um, some assistance with that to sit down and say, OK, how are you doing? Is there anything we can do to help? Uh, and then the third one is barriers resolution and rollout because we recognise that, let me skip back one, some of, these, some of these sticky problems down here, actually we can't a few organisations sitting in a room fix, we actually need a whole lot of people in the room including government, not for profit, etc. And, and I'm pleased to say first roadmap uh, exercise 
is going to be here at, the, at Cambridge, actually specifically the Institute for Manufacturing, uh, on the automotive sector on the 15th of October. So we're excited about that. Ian and Steve have been taking the lead on that. And let's see how that goes. If that's super successful, we've got a whole bunch of food and beverage companies knocking our door down to try and do one there. So we will roll that out to several other subsectors uh, subsequent to that. So we're pretty excited about that. As well, biz are very keen, um, DEFRA's uh, pretty keen, and, and we'd love to see RAP and other organisations there so that we can drive some really interesting policy outcomes where they're needed. So in conclusions, range of drivers are forcing companies to, to re-examine their resource efficiency. Uh, it's a big opportunity. These opportunities are significant and profitable and also have social and environmental benefits. So why wouldn't you do it? And what we always say as a labor Pinnell is we can help you make money and be more sustainable. If you don't care about being sustainable, let's just help you make more money, right? It's a no-lose proposition, whether you care about sustainability or not. Um, and then the third point is that every manufacturer pretty much, although I think we'd, well, Toyota is going to be a challenge, um, I think every manufacturer m can make improvement. In fact, it's not. I've actually got some data on transport uh, e efficiency and packaging that you might be interested in, Steve. Actually, if we looked at the seven areas and the four levels of improvement, every manufacturer we've ever come across has gaps in that where they can make improvements. So I think all of us need to take heart that when we hear industry saying, oh, no, not for us, it's because they don't know. It's not because there aren't savings there, because we've proven that there are savings there. And then finally, let us know if you'd like more information. The full report, all 168 pages of it, uh, you can download at www.nextmanufacturingrevolution.org um, and, and read it for yourself. There's even an executive summary there. It's only two pages long, if that's all you want to do. Uh, and happy to furnish you with any information. This is an open platform. What we want is people talking about this. We don't own it. What we actually do is we're trying to encourage other people to take this out there and let's educate the manufacturing sector on those sorts of opportunities. Steve, do I have to, how am I doing for time? Do you want me to flick? Stop. I have to stop, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. So this, for example, is... This one? Okay. Sure. Did you want to do questions after? We've got a panel after. Okay. Thank you.